Evening all. OK, let's have a look at the 1970 encounter, just two years before the classic clash, the World Championship clash between Fischer and Spassky in 1972. They met in 1970 and we saw again Boris playing white, Fischer playing black and again a debate in the Grunfeld defence. So after 93 d5 and in fact the first few moves match the 1966 game four years earlier. So Grunfeld territory, main line. So knight e2 avoiding the dreaded pin on knight f3. So f3 can be played if needed on bishop g4. So black piling up the pressure on the d4 pawn. Queen c7, rook c1, a repeat of the previous encounter so far. But now in the previous encounter, I believe it was Queen E1 here that was played. In this position, Boris decided to deviate with the move H3, which seems on the surface of it not such an aggressive move, more a preventative move potentially. But uh, we'll see during the course of the game, it's used quite aggressively. After B6, Fischer is pursuing the standard kind of plan of maybe Knight A5 later and Bishop B7 getting a crossfire of pressure across the center with his bishops. F4 again, we see a kind of familiar pattern, attacking pattern in Boris's play here with white against Groomfield. His preference now again is shown after e6 for queen e1, shifting the queen potentially on the king side. And potentially maybe again, he's trying to weaken black's king side with a bishop exchange potentially, and or an f5 in a timely uh, point. Knight a5, kicking the bishop off the diagonal again. Bishop d3, and again, a restrained blockade strategy adopted by Fischer against white playing for f5 now. So Fischer plays f5, blocking that f pawn, for the moment hemming in the bishop, and more pressure can be exerted on e4. Okay, but here we see the raf of the pawn move h3. It supports this hyper-aggressive move g4. OK, this might have taken Fischer aback, seeing g4, but is the vacuum of weaknesses actually exploitable here? Black's pieces are more focused at the moment on d4. This knight's on the rim, OK, potentially dim. This bishop could be dangerous though on the diagonal. So is this a double-edged move, this g4? Potentially, uh, most players wouldn't even consider such a move on general principle, but here it serves, in this particular position, effective purposes without too many downsides. So f takes e4 was played, which actually leaves this pawn potentially fixed and against the kind of bind of these two pawns, if they maintain a bind on black playing e5, is this pawn likely to be a target on that semi-open e file later? Bishop takes e4, bishop b7, knight g3, okay. And here you'll notice with knight g3, isn't there a weakness of the last move? Well, at the moment, cd, cd hits the queen. So that's not on the cards at the moment so easily. Knight c4, and now Boris takes on b7 and retreats the bishop. And again, here there's, a, there's an unveiling of an attack on e6. So cd4 is not that attractive in this position. And also the knight's a little bit liable as well on cd. So queen c6 now protects e6. So really, is d4 really under fire? Should white be worried? Well, Boris just counterattacks now on the c4 knight with queen e2. Fischer now plays cd, protecting the knight for the moment with the queen. And unwinding d4, of course. So c takes d4. The knight is now loose, being attacked by two pieces. So it's protected with the natural move b5. Okay, is d4 now a weakness? And is e6 actually very useful to fix that pawn? And can black potentially pile up pressure on d4? Well, Boris plays dynamically. He doesn't mind giving it up as a pawn sacrifice now. He plays knight e4. He doesn't bother with trying to defend it. Uh, we'll, we'll do a forensic examination in the second pass through the game. Why maybe rook fd1 is, is quite undesirable. 
or maybe it's a plausible move. We'll see in the second part of the game, but for the moment let's go with knight e4. So the pawn was sacrificed, bishop takes d4, and we get this very aggressive knight g5, just hitting that e6 pawn. Okay, bishop takes f2, rook takes f2, and the pawn is protected with rook d6, which seems also to make way for doubling the rooks. Isn't this going to be dangerous for white? Rook e1, putting the pressure on e6. Queen b6, pinning the f2 rook. Okay. Now, in this position, something like knight takes e6 intuitively would be risky for something like rook e8, but we'll check the possibilities in the second pass. For the moment, Boris was content to play knight e4. Knight not only hitting d6, but look at these sensitive dark squares around Black's king position. In the earlier encounter between the two in 1966, which I hope you check out the video for, it wasn't Fisher's king safety, which really was the decisive issue with the end game, the bishop and knight end game. But here, is, is the king actually uh, at risk, at graver risk than, than in the previous game encounter? Rook d4, and we see knight f6 check. The knight looks quite dangerous now. Queen takes e6, not minding the exchange of queens here. That's refused in this position with rook d6. And now we see the move queen e4, counter-attacking the rook on a8. So leaving the knight can't be taken here because of this queen a8 threat. The rook is moved and now the knight is supported with g5. Superficially, it doesn't look like very good news this position for black. This king does look a little bit insecure with this big knight on f6. Fisher plays rook d2, and this is supported now, this f2 rook, with rook e f1. So for the moment, defending, just simply defending f2, but is white ready to pounce with a move such as, say, queen e7 now, which would hit the rook and h7. So this next move maybe is designed against such a resource, queen c7 leaving the rook to be taken on d2. And actually, white wants to play a powerful centralizing move now. So he does indeed play rook takes d2, temporarily allowing a fork of queen and rook because of this very powerful attacking move he had in mind. If I give you 10 seconds here, can you spot the attacking move? I might have given you a clue already, uh, which Boris played next. So 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, Boris plays queen d4, which introduces the very, very powerful and lethal double check, sorry, pardon me, discovered check tactic, discovering a check and basically double attack on the queen as well. And also g7, so even queen g7 wouldn't be possible. So the threat of knight e8 uh, looks incredibly dangerous here. Now, in this tricky position, also d2 is being attacked. Fisher elects to play rook d8. And we get this alternate discovered check now with knight d5 discovered check. King g8 is played here. If queen g7, intuitively, it would seem, queen takes d2 is then possible with just winning a knight. So king g8 here. And in this position, queen takes d2, it would seem queen c5 is the key resource to regain material. But um, Spassky is not having that. He plays now a very cunning move in this position. Can you spot this next move at move 36? I'll give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay. Very accurate move indeed. And in fact, if you play an incorrect wrong move, you're about to lose 1,000 points. If you play the, play the correct uh, rook move, give yourself 500 points. Okay, I hope you, you're playing the correct rook move here. Rook f2, hitting the knight and making sure 
you don't play the disastrous move, give yourself minus a thousand if you play this, because this allows knight f3 check. It's important to be accurate in chess, because this forks king and queen. So rook f2 is the safe way to evict the knight, and also bring the rook in with this access route, which is very, very dangerous. There isn't any pin to be relied on here with this access route, because something like this is check. So we see here after knight c4, rook e2 is now threatening things like rook e7, it would seem. And there's no resource like rook d5. Again, check. The black king is in danger in this position. Fisher tried rook d6, but now the black king was effectively slain with this next couple of moves. After rook e8 check, forcing, absolutely forcing king f7, can you spot the final move? 39th move finishes the game, forces Fisher's resignation in this position. If I give you 10 seconds starting from now, can you guess? Okay, it was the move rook f8, a drag and drop type tactic. Fisher just resigned here. Okay, why did he resign? Well, if takes, uh, we have the very nasty check, but let's put on the engine, not to say anything too embarrassing tactically, and let's go through the game again forensically. So, try and get a bigger board. If king takes f8, check, check, pretty sure this is just winning the queen. Okay, that's all over. So this is a hopeless position after rook f8, queen h8 check. The king can't go to e7, so which is not that particularly useful anyway. Queen takes h7, winning the queen. Let's go through the game and see the engine evaluations. So the opening looks like standard theory so far in the Groomfield, absolutely standard theory. h3, the innovation, okay from the previous encounter. Now there's queen e1, a familiar pattern is set. Black's trying to restrain f5, white's trying to break through with f5 and weaken black's king position even further. Because it hasn't got the usual defensive knight around it. The price plays paid of hypermodernism, hypermodernism to attack the center, like with the bishops, is sometimes king safety is a small price paid. Sometimes it's too high a price though, so f5, and Spassky is playing directly for king safety now. When he plays g4, he's really trying to smash down the defences of black's king. Okay. So, f takes e4. And in this position, the evaluations, I'll just tell you to leave the board size reasonably good. It's Actually, the engine likes Houdini, likes black in this position so far, a little bit, on brief analysis anyway. It looks as though black was doing fine, so you might wonder what the turning point is. Even bishop d4 is reasonably liked. So dynamic play from white to be a pawn down here. Okay, queen b6, and now actually after queen b6, maybe that's a small inaccuracy. Rook c8 is recommended instead, with still a small advantage for for black. But here, after queen b6, something changes. First of all, there's the implication that f5 might be strong as well, which wasn't played. But um, knight e4, again, looks from an engine point of view an inaccuracy, but it looks from a human point of view a very dangerous move to get into f6. Now taking on e6, of course, restores material equality as well. And this is given as about equal from an engine point of view, believe it or not, this position. So after rook f8, that looks like a blunder. Here, the critical move seems to be rook ad8, not rook f8. After rook ad8 or rook c8, rook ad8 is the preferred rook move. And now after g5, it seems white has secured a significant advantage. You might think, well, what is this technical? difference 
here. Let's have a quick look. Rook a d8. If g5 is played here, the technical difference, maybe this rook d2, the rook is secure, supported by its friend. And there's no, uh, or maybe rook f1 is not so pliable, or maybe it is. Okay, but it looks as though black's doing fine here. So that looks a safer king than the game with the rooks using that d file dou doubled there. Okay, so in the game, with rook f8 being played and g5, white is securing now a small technical advantage. Queen c7 and the advantage grew from quite significantly after queen c7. So that looks to be the first major mistake, in fact. Here it does seem tricky if king g7 is the recommended move. Uh, it looks silly to play king g7. But I guess the idea is the king to help itself defensively. If a move like check, there's rook f7. If check here, king g8, it's it's uh, no big deal apparently. So king g7 was helping itself, but queen c7 is now setting up and losing control, a weakness of the last move, it has to be said. Official weakness of the last move, that he, by playing queen c7, he's come off d4, which is a critical central square in this position, and Spassky proves that, absolutely proves that, by playing rook takes d2, to get rid of all of black's protection of the d4 square, and now use that square tactically with queen d4 here, threatening the knight, and threatening the lethal knight e8 check, exposing an attack on the king and the queen. I've read very recently the Averback uh, that uh, the basis of most tactical combinations is the double attack in the wider sense, not just false, because, um, for example, you know, the opponent only has one move at a time. If you can overload the opponent with two or more threats, then it's very, very difficult for them to do anything about that. So the basis of most successful tactics is giving the opponent too many problems at the same time. So here, knight e8 check, very, very powerful uh, tactic. Rook d8 is insufficient. Apparently an engine move is actually queen b6, just pinning the queen just in time. And here, this, the advantage, although it's horrible to accept double pawns, this was, was better than the game by far, by far, this continuation. So, okay, so after rook d1, King g2, this would be better for white, but less than half a pawn advantage, believe it or not. So queen b6 was the objective move to play in this position to extinguish the fires. Get rid of the queens. Queen b6, make use of the pin. Okay, but Fisher played rook d8, and we get this crushing sequence. Maybe it was underestimated. This is, Houdini really likes this sequence. Knight d5 check. Houdini really likes, and now the rook f2. There's not too many choices for the rook because of the knight f3 for it anyway. And now this uh, rook e2 is really, is plus 2.75 here. So one small inaccuracy, and now, you know, king safety has really been uh, exposed of the black king here. We're talking 2.75. So rook d6, and now that's just, just finishing to the end. It's swiftly to the end. A more tenacious defense would have been queen d6. Perhaps, but it's still about plus three. Rook e7, queen b6 here. <laughs> Very tactical computer-like defense. But even here, this can be broken down with check. And then knight takes b6, breaking that defense down, that resource. So really, the attack is too strong here. Check is the final crushing move. Absolutely engine approved sequence. Okay, and that forced Fisher's resignation for clear reasons that Queen H8 and Queen H7 is just winning the Queen. Okay, I hope you got something from this Grunfield game. And check out the previous one. So King Safety really was emphasized in this game compared to the previous Grunfield encounter. And this set the stage for their battle in 1972. So up to 1972, Fisher had first lost the King's Gambit game. Then he had lost two Grunfield games. And there were two other draws, though, which may be worth look checking out on this channel 
to have a look at the draws if they were fighting or not then why not let's have a look at all the five encounters okay comments or questions on youtube thanks very much